Eric Sean of the South, we're keeping our hands sharp with the help of Case Knives, the sponsor of this episode. A tradition of my family for generations, my granddaddy used to say the best cure for idle hands was to build something. But in today's day and age, everything's done with a click, a swipe, or a tap. But how about we put away the screens and put your hands to work with a case knife? Let's take a drive through the south, a drive through the great land of cotton just below the Mason-Dixon line. The Yellowhammer State is where we are today, and we're riding two-lane highways. Small, narrow two-lane highways with log trucks in front of us. It's cars behind us that are flashing their brights trying to get around the line of traffic. But I'm in no hurry. I'm in no hurry, because this is the land that I love to see, and I love to see it at eye level. I love to see hay fields, which are soft enough to sleep in. I love to see barns that are barely standing upright, and I love to see the remnants of old chimneys and abandoned acreage. I love to see old brick structures, which are swallowed in vines, and homes that are a little bit lopsided. I like to see porches that are well used, porches with sofas on the fronts, rocking chairs, or even deep freezers. Maybe putting a deep freeze on the porch sounds trashy to you. It's a good thing it's not your porch. I like to drive and I like to see the life that peppers this part of the world. There's a dog and he's walking the shoulder. He doesn't seem to have a place to go. He's just trotting along. In the city, you must keep your dogs on a leash, but out here it's okay. It's okay to let them just wander. Past low-lying bridges over creeks, which which snake through the woods and the longleaf pines. And there's a bicycle, a bicycle on that bridge. I don't know what the child of that bicycle is doing, but I have a feeling that he's probably fishing. There is no memory so golden as a memory which involves a fishing rod. When you keep on driving, you will see rural people in their yards doing work. These are people who believe in working from can to can. It's their contribution to this planet. They don't believe in spending a day, a day on this earth without sweating. Sweat is what makes it all worth it. And if they were to wake up and not open their pores and let some of that salt water out, it would be a day wasted. You can see their gardens, you can see their acreage blooming with corn, blooming with alfalfa and soy and peanuts. God bless the peanut plant. And right now while I take you along this road trip to the south, I am eating bored peanuts. I got them a peanut stand right on the Alabama floor line. I'm reaching into this bag and I am peeling them while I drive with my knees behind that log truck. I'm watching live oaks with trunks as big as wagon wheels past my window. I'm noticing the Spanish moss hanging in the trees. I see, I see a boy who is walking along the shoulder. He reminds me a lot of the dog I just passed. He's got the same intent in mind. He's taking in his world one step at a time. It seems like today kids have devices in their pocket which are smarter than the human brain and they require more electricity than the average radio. And this child carries this phone in his pocket and he has a leash on him but he does not know it. He can be reached any time of day by any person who has his number. Something's been lost. And if by chance you're listening to this and you feel like something is missing, something simple is missing, something from your childhood has been lost, if you used to look at Saturday evening post covers and wish that the Rockwell pictures could come to life, God bless you. God bless you. God bless bold peanuts. God bless the American South.
You are listening to Sean of the South and that music you're about to hear is Grant Ferris from Nashville, Tennessee. Grant Ferris, everybody. read you a little bit of our mail. Dylan Andrews, St. Paul, Minnesota, writes, I'm far, far, far from home in Columbus, Georgia, and I miss it. Winter in Minnesota gets so cold I can't feel my own feet for four months, and I'm grumpy all the time. My bones ache. I was not designed for that kind of winter. The temperature in January was in the single digits, Sean. It's just not natural. I get transferred next year, so they tell me, to Texas. I can't wait to be closer to home. Lori Jordan, Macon, Georgia. My husband, Rick, has turned 42 today. His father has helped me round up his old baseball team for a surprise birthday party at the old baseball park where he once played Little League and Babe Ruth. The idea is that they're going to go play a game. We'll have cake and beer and food, and I'll be sitting in the bleachers with the first aid kit. When my big, out-of-shape husband pulls a hamstring or breaks his neck sliding into home, I want to be there. Meredith from Shanghai, China. Hi, Sean. It felt only right to drop you a line and express how much I like your show. My sister turned me on to your podcast and your writings, and that's just one more thing I have to thank her for. I was born in Mississippi, raised in northwest Florida. I end up stating this fact often since I currently live in Shanghai. The 
only thing I love more than living abroad is getting to return home to visit to the deep south. While I wait for my next trip home, I will keep listening to your show to cure my occasional bout of homesickness. Ryan Jacobson, Lakeland, Florida. Hi, Sean. I have a brother-in-law who is from China. At first, we were trying to teach him American things like how to chew tobacco or fish with worms or the rules of a football game or the right way to brew a strong cup of coffee. But he was getting the hang of this American thing pretty good. A few weeks ago, he offered to cook for us guys while we were playing cards. He cooked chicken and fish with noodles. And he cooked it in a way I'd never had it before. And I'll tell you, it was the best stuff I've ever had in my life. It was unbelievable, man. All this time, we've been trying to teach him stuff about being American, and we all kind of realize there's a lot we have to learn about being in this world. So, to make a long story short, Sean, I'm writing you at four in the morning because I'm on my way to meet Ying for Tai Chi. He told us to dress comfortable, so I'm wearing my swim trunks. <laughs> That's all I had. Jennifer Cutts, Montgomery, Alabama. Hi, Sean. My daughter is a beginning guitar player, and at first, she got an electric guitar. We thought we were going to lose our mind when she started playing that thing. It was so loud, it was like listening to a rocket ship in her bedroom. Then she started getting into classical music. Classical music because of a boy she liked. She traded her electric guitar for a wood one, and now she can play Bach. Bach. And she can't stand the electric guitar anymore. Funny how teenage tastes change so quickly. And it turns out she's really good at the guitar. My husband dug a hole in the backyard one night while my daughter was asleep, and he buried that electric guitar in the dirt just in case she ever gets the big idea to play rock music again. (laughs) Malcolm Gustafson, Atlanta, Georgia. John, my dad listens to your show in the shower, and it's true. He plugs his phone into a portable speaker and cranks it up so loud that the sound of the shower is about to vibrate the tile off of the wall. And he listens. He takes long, long showers... And when he's done, there's no hot water left for at least another hour. And my mother is always very, very angry with him because she can't do laundry or run the dishwasher because he's used it all up. Anyway, say hello to my dad while he's in the shower. Hello, Malcolm's father in the shower. Make sure you scrub those hard-to-reach parts. Benita Vasquez, Mandera, Texas. My son is a kid who beat cancer. He's in his eighth year of remission, and I just want your listeners to know that it can be done, whoever you are. There is no such thing as a doctor who knows everything. So keep fighting, keep believing, and never give up. Love you, Manuel. Love you. Marion Watley, Grove City, Pennsylvania. Sean, I stumbled upon your show by accident. I was looking for an old friend named Sean on Google, and I found your show. I listened to a bunch, and I just want to say thank you. I feel like we are friends now, and I feel like one day I'm going to visit the South and maybe even look you up. Dear Marion, come on down. Charlene Daniels, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. My dad is a preacher, and he still keeps a full garden on his back two acres. He's done this since I was a kid. This year, he was showing my sons how to plow and telling them things that the old-timers used to say. And then it came up about using a donkey to plow a field. My dad talked about things like saying G and haw to guide the donkey. My dad is the kind of guy who takes things too far, so he went into town and he bought a donkey. And he bought an antique plow he restored, and he taught my sons how to plow a field the old-fashioned way. We have pictures of it and everything. Dad's a neat guy. I just thought you'd like to know about him. Robert Callis, Gardner, Kansas. My son was trying to play a practical joke on me. He's a 41-year-old man. Now get this. He bought a pair of shoes identical to the ones I wear every day. And to make them look old, he scuffed them up in all the exact same places mine are scuffed up. And he broke them in. It took several weeks to get them to look and feel like a pair of old shoes. These shoes were, of course, two sizes smaller than my shoes. One day he replaced these shoes, my shoes, with these two small shoes. And I wore them for up to a whole month before I realized what had happened. I had blisters on my feet and painful foot problems. Finally, I realized what he'd done, and I got him back. I snuck into his house one day, and I left a glass of milk in his air conditioner duct. After three days, it started to sour, and it stunk up the whole house so bad that they had to move out temporarily and live with my sister. I told my son, when it was all said and done, 
Son, I've been doing this a lot longer than you. I've been playing practical jokes since before you were born, and you don't mess with a pro. Jewel McDonald, Fairhope, Alabama. I had to pick up my kids from my ex-husband's house, and it was the first time I had met his new girlfriend. It killed me inside. On the way home, I was holding a stiff upper lip, trying not to cry. Off the highway, my kids and I saw a full church parking lot with lights on and everything. And on a Saturday night, something made me pull over. We walked inside, and they were all singing, and the preaching was pretty good. And it made us feel like we belonged there. Then, everyone ate food in the fellowship hall, and my daughter ate so much barbecue, she was looking a little pale. Before we left, they sent us home with plates of food and to-go containers of chicken salad and casseroles and all kinds of stuff that you write about. People I didn't even know were hugging me, and they were telling me it was going to be all right. These people were strangers, but they certainly didn't act like it. I haven't been back to church there, but I might go this Sunday, and I feel better just knowing that there are all sorts of nice folks out there. And I thought that sounded like something you'd like to hear. Dear Jewel, here's to all the nice people in the world. Without them... This world would be like a tomato sandwich without any Duke's mayonnaise. Fred Moseman, Hendersonville, Tennessee. My wife is going to be 50 today. 50. She thinks she looks old, but she don't. She has white hair, and I love white hair. She thinks she's a granny, but she's the prettiest girl I've ever seen. She's been through a lot in her time. Her first marriage ended her almost. And I am her second husband. I hope I have brought her back to life. I have made it my goal to make her the happiest woman alive and help her believe that she deserves to be that way. We've been married 12 years last month. She is the reason I am so happy every day. Every day I wake up, I think to myself, I have my own love story. She gave me my own love story. She is my love. If you could wish her happy birthday on your show, I would be so grateful. Her name is Connie. Happy birthday, Connie, from your husband, Fred Moseman. I hope you all do something nice today, something fun. And that's letters from our listeners. Let's have another song from Grant Ferris. Grant Ferris.
This is the part of the world where people say things like, welcome, you can stay as long as you want. You hear that all sorts of places. You hear that at church after someone invites you home for, for supper. Ooh, if you ever get invited to somebody's house for, for Sunday supper, you ought to go. And after supper, your host might look at you, and they might bestow upon you the greatest honor any host can bestow upon a dinner guest. They might let you slurp the tomato water at the bottom of the plate of raw sliced tomatoes. This is a higher honor than giving someone the last biscuit. That tomato water, that tomato water is gold. And usually the host will remove that plate without offering, and he will slurp that tomato water in the kitchen when nobody's looking. But if you are offered to slurp that tomato water, by God, you're as good as family, and you can stay as long as you want. I like two-lane highways. I love them, actually. There's something about a two-lane highway that just opens you up to the possibilities of a life that you might not might not know. Let me explain myself because I can see on the looks of some of your faces that that sounded like a ludicrous statement. And I am known for making ludicrous statements. A two-lane highway is behind the world. It's backstage. It's, it's behind the scenes. You must have an, a backstage pass to ride a two-lane highway. The world takes place on the center stage, and those are big cities. You can go to Birmingham or Atlanta, Georgia, or Nashville, Tennessee, and you're going to see the stage. People are, are, are parading themselves around front in peacock-style hairdos. And, and in Nashville, they wear glittered jeans and boots, which, which cost $1,700. And these boots go on the feet of men who sing country music who look like pretty boy Thompson who have never done a hard day's work in their life and have baby smooth hands. <laughs> They're on the main stage, people and corporations and CEOs and men who, who, when they breathe, they believe a tree should die. But the two-lane highway, the two-lane highway snakes through the backwoods the place where the people who, who help the world keep going live. No, these aren't people who get a whole lot of attention, but they are people who are incredibly important. When you drive a two-lane highway, you're going to see things that you don't normally see. You're going to see strange things. You're going to see signs which read, pharmacy and drugstore, guns and ammunition and Bibles sold. Or you'll read something that reads, Go to church or the devil's going to get you. <laughs> there used to be a billboard on I-65 which read, Go to church or the devil will get you. And my mother used to point at that billboard while we drove past it and say, See? See, I've been trying to tell you. <laughs> my mother, God bless her, she, she was a Baptist with Pentecostal leanings. She was a Baptocostal. And she, she, she liked that sign because it gave her an opportunity to to start singing songs while we drove like, just give me that old time religion. And I would try to cover my ears and die. <laughs> that billboard, it got taken down. I've never been so sad to see a, a landmark be taken down. I, I don't agree with the contents of that billboard. In fact, I, I, I despise it. But I liked seeing that little icon of a devil with his butt near the flames of hell. <laughs> because I knew we were getting close to where we were going whenever I saw that billboard. I miss it. I miss it. I hope one day someone might listen to this and decide to put that sucker back up. When you're driving on a two-lane highway, you're going you're gonna to encounter people who drive a little bit differently than you do. Like the man who's behind me right now while I drive through the south. There's a man. He is, he is weaving back and forth. I can see him in my rearview mirror. Once he goes to the left, once he goes to the right, then he, he finds his center again right behind me, and he looks miserable. I can see him throwing his hands up in my rearview mirror, and he's banging his hands on his steering wheel. This is a man who needs to consume more fiber. Oh, yes, this is a man who is pent up on the inside, and he is looking to pass me. And even though it's a double line on that highway, he is fixing to take his opportunity to speed past me. 
And in order to speed past me, it won't take much effort because I'm only traveling 55. I don't believe in going over 55 on old country highways. Now, I've seen a lot of people drive 75 and 85, but these are people that I consider to be part of the mission field. <laughs> that man, he's behind me and he's going left and right. And when he finds his opening, there's a double line, but he's going to pass anyway. I can hear his transmission gun, and he guns it, and he's, he's weaving past me in that lane. And right ahead of us is a semi-truck. Now, we are in a pickle here. Because I do not believe in speeding up, I decide I must slow down, so I slow way down to like 30 miles an hour so he can get over ahead of me. And that truck just barely misses him. And then he speeds along. And I know people like this. I know people like this. These are people with high blood pressure. (laughs) This man probably sped past me and cussed my name. Well, he didn't know my name, so he probably cussed my license plate number. And it is where the lower part of Alabama kisses the handle of Florida that I love the most. It's around these parts that you see certain trees you don't see other places and you see you see a certain kind of person a person who is easier going than folks you'll find in the bigger cities like I said backstage people we're used to being backstage we're used to not being seen we're used to being we're used to being the one who helps you fix your car we're used to being the one who who lets you go ahead of us in line at the Walmart because you're in a, in a hurry. We're not. We don't like big cities. We don't mind them, but we never live there. We like to see big bodies of water that you, can, that you can cast a line into. Big cities don't have this. The only time I went up to New York City, I was 20 years old. I was with my choir director, Mr. Bob. And we walked through the doors of, of the airport and we were greeted with about 9,000 people just coming off the plane. We found a taxi, and the man who was driving the taxi could only say a few words in English. He drove erratically back and forth. He was, he was showing his finger to certain motorists on the road, a finger which I dare not show you here tonight. And when we got to the hotel, we tipped him, and I guess, I guess Brother Bob didn't tip him enough, and so he said a very, very disgusting word and he drove off Bob and I got settled into our room and we were going to go go for a little walk and find a restaurant for supper and while we were walking along there was a crosswalk and about 900 people were waiting on the other side of the road for the little traffic light to turn from a red hand to a blue walking man and when that happened These people, this crowd, the children of Israel, the multitudes of God were walking toward me. And I got lost in a sea of bodies, a sea of folks in black suits and earth tone colors and and ladies carrying yoga mats. And they were on all sides of me like a whirlpool of people. And I lost Brother Bob. He was was about 100 foot ahead of me. And I said, Bob. Bob. And he looked toward me and he reached his hand out and he said, Sean. And it was as if the Red Sea had closed over me, but Charlton Heston had gone on without me. Finally, Brother Bob found me. And when he found me, my heart was beating so fast and my forehead was sweating and I was sick to my stomach. He said, what's wrong? I said, I'm sick. Something's wrong. He took me to a walk-in clinic, and I sat in this walk-in clinic, and there were all sorts of people wearing surgical masks. Now, that'll make you feel real good to see people wearing surgical masks. You start thinking of all the infectious diseases you've heard about on the news, and you start realizing that these are true diseases. Just because they didn't exist in your little two-lane highway world doesn't mean they don't exist. In the cities, they exist, and they are there with a vengeance. They are waiting to make your face fall off and your eyeballs turn purple. The doctor was a nice man. He was a nice man who happened to be from Dothan, Alabama. And I've never been so happy to see a good old boy in all my life. He set me down on that bench, that doctor's bench, which is covered in wax paper. I don't really understand the significance of the wax paper. I try to keep pretty clean back there. (laughs) 
I can't shake the feeling when I sit on benches like that that I'm a pastrami on rice sandwich getting ready to be sent out for delivery. <laughs> a dose an Alabama doctor, he patted me on the shoulder. He said, you are having a panic attack, son. A panic attack. He said, you've probably never been around this many people or these tall buildings in all your life. Brother Bob said, well, well, well what could he do? What, what should we do? And that doctor, he just, he just sat down and he smiled at me. He said, get out of New York City. <laughs> and when you go, take me with you. <laughs> I didn't last long in New York City. It wasn't a city that was designed for me. And when our plane, when our plane crossed the border, the Mason-Dixon line, something changed inside that, that air cabin. I could feel the air get a little bit more moist. And when we landed, we landed in Valparaiso, Florida, which is only about 10 miles from my house. I walked off that plane into the fresh air and the sunshine, and the first thing I could smell was mold and mildew. God bless Florida mold and mildew. There is no smell I love better. It is in our drinking water. And when you don't have it, you miss it. Yes, it might smell like old gym socks or an old retired jock strap, but it is a beautiful smell if it's in your blood. I saw longleaf pines in the distance. The longleaf pine is a straight shafted pine with a furry top. They look like elders, if you ask me. Elders who are looking down upon us and reminding us that life doesn't have to be fast. Even when you talk, you don't have to talk so fast. These are the lessons that you get from people who sit in plastic patio chairs outside the fronts of old country stores. These are the lessons that you get when you're talking to someone who's got white hair, who still wears a frilly apron and cooks cornbread in an iron skillet. These are the lessons that you get when you sit around a table and you're just talking and chewing the fat and nothing's really being said. And that's as far as the conversation goes. Conversations don't have to accomplish anything. Sometimes we, we, we put too much pressure on ourselves. These are the lessons learned while you're driving through two lane highways. Two lane highways to the lower half of the country. Highways where the yellow, yellow lines are a little bit faded some places in the highway don't have those reflective dots in the center of the highway. And many places don't have enough shoulder to say grace over. But don't worry. Because if you ever have car problems here, someone will be there to help you. Matter of fact, someone will be there to help you whether or not you have car problems. All you've got to do is pull over and ask. We're there. We're there and we see you. And we'd like to welcome you to our part of the world. And you can stay as long as you want. Hey, thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich, and it has been a real pleasure. Hope you join us next week. That music you heard behind me today was Grant Ferris, John Mylander, Chris Donahue, and Noah Denny backing him up. Man, this guy is good. A stringed instrument prodigy from Nashville, Tennessee, playing nylon, string banjo, and any other stringed instrument you can throw at him. To find out anything more about what he does, you can visit grantferris.com or look him up on CD Baby, iTunes, or Spotify. To find out anything more about what I do, you can visit seanofthesouth.com. While you're there, I hope you'll drop me a line about your birthday announcements or your wedding anniversaries or bar mitzvahs because I love to hear from my friends. And speaking of friends, friends, this podcast has been recorded in honor of my 13-year-old bloodhound, Ella May, who just went to be with the Lord last night. If you got a pet, I hope you hold them tight tonight because they are one of God's greatest gifts to humanity. Adios.